When I first got this free McCulloch chainsaw, I thought I was pretty lucky. That is, until I realized that I need to do a lot of work to it to get it working again. After replacing the fuel lines, I was beginning to regret my choice to even pick it up, but since I've come this far, I might as well see it through to the end. I just hope this chainsaw runs and cuts, otherwise I may have to put this one on my own curb to be given away. What's up everyone and thank you for stopping by. Today's project is the second part of fixing this McCulloch chainsaw and the problem is that we just spent the last hour changing the fuel lines and we still have a little bit more to go. Let's take a good look at it, find out what's wrong with it and hopefully we can fix it. Now in this video we're going to try and repair this chainsaw, however it may not be the exact repair you need to make to yours. We'll explore other options later in the video. Now we're only going to mention what these other options could be, we don't have time to look into them, but if you need more information on these options you're welcome to ask as many questions as you need to. Just to recap what we've done so far, we found out that the saw does run when we put fuel into the carb's throat. We also performed a compression test only to discover that the engine is not perfect and has quite a bit of wear on it. We then found out that the fuel lines were in bad shape and we ended up replacing them. This is what the lines should look like after they've been replaced and if you want to see how to replace the fuel lines on this chainsaw, click on the link at the top right of your screen, there will also be a link at the end of this video. Before we install the carb, I want to take this opportunity to inspect it for any issues and that's because I don't have any information about how this chainsaw was running, so I'd hate to install a carb that wasn't working the way it was supposed to. After removing the pumping side of the carb, we want to make sure that the inlet screen is not clogged with debris. Fortunately, this one is clear, however, there may be varnish on it that's preventing fuel from passing through it. We'll test that later on because I want to inspect the pumping diaphragm first. Now, this diaphragm is clear, so it's a bit hard to see, but what we're looking for are these two check valve flaps to be flat and parallel with the rest of the diaphragm. The easiest way to check is to look at it from the side. Fortunately, these look parallel so we can reuse it. If yours are bent, I would consider getting a rebuild kit for your carb. The next thing I want to check is the metering diaphragm that's underneath this metal plate. We want to make sure it's still flexible and it's not petrified. The diaphragm is stuck to the plate which means we can see the rocker arm assembly and luckily it's very clean underneath here. So here's the metering diaphragm and this doesn't happen very often but this one is still in good shape. I did separate it from the gasket so I can feel just how flexible it is and even though I have a replacement ready, I don't think it's needed. Before we put everything back together, I want to put some fuel on the inlet screen and then press the rocker arm on the other side of the carb. This is the flow test I was talking about earlier. As soon as I press the rocker arm, the fuel should disappear through the screen, but unfortunately, it's not doing that. That means we need to remove the rocker arm assembly on the other side so we can safely clean the screen with carb cleaner. When taking the rocker arm assembly off the carb, just be very careful because there's a small spring that can be easily lost. Once the screw is gone, carefully remove the rocker arm, pin, spring, and needle and put them somewhere safe. We're now ready to start cleaning the screen and I'm going to use carb cleaner. I'm going to spray some onto the screen and then agitate it and hopefully the cleaner should disappear by passing through it. Now you may have to do this more than a couple of times and once you're confident that it is clean, we'll then put some fuel onto the screen and hopefully it will pass through the screen as well. After putting some fuel on the screen, you can see it easily passed through at this time. That means we're now ready to reassemble the carb. Now when putting the needle and rocker arm assembly back on, just be very careful because if you drop or lose one of these parts, you might as well replace the entire carb, otherwise you'll have to run a magnet across the floor to find the part you're missing. Once the screw is back into place, try pressing the rocker arm and make sure it's moving like this one is. Now I'm going to do the flow test once again just to make sure it still works with the assembly in place. And as you can see, it's still working just like it's supposed to. If yours isn't flowing or isn't flowing very quickly, you'll have to remove the rocker arm assembly again and continue cleaning the screen. I'll then replace the gasket, metering diaphragm, and its metal plate. After replacing the metal plate over the metering diaphragm, we can now reassemble the pumping side on the carb. The next thing I'm going to do is a bit contested. These are the fuel adjustment screws and they have limiters on them to keep them from being adjusted too much. However, they might get in the way if we need to adjust them to get the saw to run well, so I'm going to remove them. Now these can be a bit stubborn to remove, so just take your time. Once the last one has been taken off, we can see the head of the screws, which are slotted. That means we don't need any special tools to adjust them. The screw closer to the engine is the L screw, and it's for low engine speed fuel adjustment and for revving the engine from idle to full speed. Now, the screw closer to the air filter is the H screw, and it's for adjusting fuel when the trigger is fully squeezed. There's supposed to be an H here, but you can't see it because of the plastic covering it. 
Before we do any adjusting, I'm going to see where the screws are set at. To do that, I'm going to turn them clockwise, counting the number of turns until they stop. That way, if I get lost while I'm tuning the carb, I can always put it back to where I found it. It looks like the L screw was set at one and a quarter turns. I'll then turn it back to where I found it, then do the same for the other screw. So it looks like the H screw is set at one and a half turns. This is something that I don't normally do, but it might help those who are just starting to tune small engine carbs. It's finally time to install the carb back onto the engine. Now the fuel line that has the fuel filter on it goes to the port on the right side of the carb. While I can still maneuver the carb, I'll then reconnect the throttle linkage. After that, I'll then install the fuel line from the purge bulb to the port on the left side of the carb. Before I install the last line on the bulb, I'm going to shorten these lines because they're just a little bit too long. I'll start with the line that's already connected to the bulb and then I'll shorten the last line as well. Now I'm not going to install the purge bulb to the cover just yet. Instead, I'm going to put some fuel into the tank and do a test purge so I can confirm that the fuel is flowing through the lines like it's supposed to. So when pressing the purge bulb, fuel should flow through this line first and then make its way through the carb and out the left side port. The fuel will then flow into the bulb through the shorter port, fill part of the bulb with some fuel and then out the longer port and make its way back to the tank. So it took a lot of pressing, but as you just saw, the fuel flowed through the lines just like they were supposed to. If yours doesn't work this way, you might have to double check the routing and connections again. If you don't see any fuel, then you might have a carb issue. Now that I know ours is good, I'll continue putting the saw back together. Once the filter base is back on, check to make sure that the throttle is working like it should and it's not getting tangled in the wires or the fuel lines, otherwise your saw might stay at full throttle the first time you squeeze it, which is quite dangerous. After that, we can then snap the bulb back into place and then put the last few pieces back on. I almost forgot, we still need to replace the spark plug and the clutch cover. Now this would have been a great time to replace the plug, however, we can change that anytime we need to, and besides, this one still looks to be in great shape. Too bad we can't say the same thing for the piston ring. If you're uncertain about how to mix your two-stroke oil and gasoline, I'd suggest asking for advice. And if you don't want to let them know it's for you, just tell them that your friend wanted to know. Maybe I'm missing something, but I didn't see a way to tension the chain. I guess I have to just pull on the bar while I tighten the nuts. Oh, and I wouldn't suggest using a power tool to tighten the bolts, and you'll see why in a little bit. The last thing we need to do is to replace the two bolts on the handle and add some bar oil to the tank. I'm going to only fill it halfway full just in case we have a leak and that way it won't go everywhere. So here's where we can access all the adjustment screws on the side of the saw. The opening marked with the letter T is to adjust the engine's idle speed and the larger opening is for the fuel adjustment screws on the carb and luckily these are clearly marked. Now that everything is back together on the saw we're finally ready to try and start it.
So what just happened? Well, I had to add some more fuel to the engine at idle so it could rev properly, and as a byproduct, it lowered the idle speed, which then allowed the chain to stop moving. Also, the chain was way too loose, and before I take a practice cut, I'm going to look at the drive gear on the clutch to see if it's got some wear on it. Sometimes if the teeth are worn out on the drive gear, you might have an issue with the chain not wanting to stay tight, and it looks like this one has some wear on it, but it's not the worst I've ever seen. It's still quite usable, but I would suggest replacing in the future. For right now, I'm going to retension the chain and then tighten the nuts with a hand tool instead of my impact. I know I didn't try adjusting the H screw, but I want to try it again when I have some green wood to cut instead of this limb that's been dead for a very long time that only fell last year, but it did seem to do well with the few cuts I did take. I also believe the chain was a little bit too tight, so I'll loosen it and then look to see if there's a better log to practice on. So another option as to why they gave this chainsaw away is that it's not supported in the aftermarket anymore. It's a real shame, but then again, they gave away this saw after 20 years, so it makes sense that they don't have parts for it anymore, and the best option was to just buy a brand new one. So my question is, would you pay $100 in service to get your old saw running again, knowing that you can't find any major components for it, like the fuel and oil tank, or even the ignition coil, or would you rather put that $100 towards a brand new saw instead? Personally, I wouldn't buy another saw until this one breaks, but it'd be a hard decision to invest that much money into repair on something that doesn't have much of a future. Thank you for watching. I really do appreciate your time here. Please feel free to ask me any questions, and I hope to see you in the next video.